events leading up to 1963 were starting to paint a very disturbing picture in my mind. William Branham's mentor, Reverend Roy E. Davis, was declaring war against civil rights. The propaganda campaigns from William Branham's sermons worked either alongside or in cooperation with the white supremacy groups against John F. Kennedy for his support of civil rights. Kennedy was sending a military presence to the South as white supremacy groups turned violent. The FBI was conducting an investigation into Roy Davis after learning that the original Knights of the Ku Klux Klan were arming themselves under the alias Louisiana Rifle Association. White supremacy groups were rising against freedom seekers like James Meredith, who simply wanted a public university and an equal opportunity. Hearing Branham repeating the same things that white supremacy groups were saying about these men turned my stomach. Seeing statements and publications produced by hate groups, statements exactly like William Branham's sermons contained about freedom fighters such as Martin Luther King being communist was awful. Listening to him publicly shame African Americans was more than I could stand now that I understood the context and the climate of our country in those days. When I learned that he announced plans to take his children out of school just two days before Martin Luther King's request for a second emancipation, after Roy Davis declared that he was preparing for war and that he had intentions to stay with them, but he was planning to become a wanderer, I couldn't stop thinking about the Americanization project and Roy Davis's plans for a third wave of the Ku Klux Klan. Did William Branham move his family out of harm's way on purpose? Was he planning to part ways with Roy Davis? Did he become a wanderer to go into hiding from Davis and his military sect of the Ku Klux Klan? Or did he plan to join them? If he did separate from Roy Davis, it would have been significant. Davis ordained Branham into the Pentecostal faith and trained him in the faith healing ministry. It was Roy Davis's Pentecostal church where Branham met his first wife, Hope. Branham had stood by Davis' side even after his criminal activities and the Ku Klux Klan affiliation were exposed in Jeffersonville, Indiana. He assumed leadership over Roy Davis's congregation and joined with elders of Roy Davis's Pentecostal church when Davis was extradited to Arkansas. After Roy Davis and William Upshaw were involved with the orphanage scandal, Branham drew even closer to them, using Upshaw to pose as a wheelchair invalid in his healing meetings. Branham dropped the name Roy Davis over a hundred times in meetings from California to Florida and up into Canada. And that was just in the transcripts that we were allowed to see. There is no telling of how many times William Branham promoted Roy Davis prior to 1947 or in the sermons that were quote-unquote lost. Roy Davis was a name that we grew up hearing often in the message. This was Dr. Davis, as William Branham called him. He was part of our religion, even though we had no idea what he represented. Until I learned the details surrounding the situation leading to the prophet's move to Tucson, I would have never even considered the two men parting ways. The thought of the prophet going into hiding as a wanderer would have never crossed my mind. At first, it seemed as though that were the case. William Branham started describing a conflict of opinion over doctrine between Davis and himself, and I thought for sure that Davis's nationally publicized exposure as the imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan would have caused Branham to sever ties. Even after discovering Branham's awful statements against African Americans, I thought surely the two men must have separated. Later, when I learned that William Branham knew the Imperial Wizard's travel schedule as late as 1964, that of a man whose schedule even the federal government did not know, I was absolutely shocked. Not only was he aware of Davis's location, he expected Davis to attend some of his meetings. Branham held multiple meetings in multiple states. The places that Branham wandered were places that Davis knew intimately. He preached near the Davis Mountains. Another meeting place was in Fort Worth, one of Davis's 
political strongholds. Was more going on during William Branham's frequent trips from Tucson to Jeffersonville than we knew about? I thought back to some disturbing information that I had stumbled onto in 2011. A former message member had pointed out a stop in Houston, Texas on March 4, 1963. This date was so problematic to message theology that it has been the subject of debate for decades. William Branham's daughter, Rebecca, published an entire newsletter to explain how this date was possible, because according to the timeline, it simply could not have happened the way William Branham claimed in his sermons. William Branham claimed to be away from the public hunting on February 28, 1963, during a strange cloud event in Arizona. To his Tucson peers, he was away hunting and then leaving for Jeffersonville. To his Jeffersonville crowd, he had just came from Tucson and claimed to be standing just below the cloud hunting. The problem? He was allegedly hunting javelina, but hunting season for javelina was not until March 1st through 10th, 1963. Even more troubling, Branham gave several locations that he claimed to be standing under the cloud. The one we remembered most in the message was Rattlesnake Mesa, and the message believers make their pilgrimage to the hallowed site each year, calling it Sunset Mountain, since the prophet claimed that his hunting trip took place on Sunset Mountain. He claimed that Sunset Mountain is where he stood under the mysterious cloud formation. It's very confusing, because after Branham was given a detailed description of the cloud, he claimed to be northwest of Flagstaff, or Prescott. I began to wonder why William Branham was so insistent upon being there. What was he doing in Houston that was important enough to be deceptive? I first discovered this information in the book, A Logical Refutation of William Branham's Message. I was shocked the first time that I learned that Branham's exact location spanned over 320 kilometers, and that when message believers were given proof of the cloud, they were only given the initial query, not the full report. The mysterious cloud that floated across northern Arizona on February 28, 1963, was important to the message. Many message believers, including I myself, were shown articles in Life and Science magazines that covered the information concerning the cloud. The preliminary report given by James E. MacDonald was passed around the cult following as if it were specially written for us. His report was the second half of a two-part confirmation that William Branham was in Arizona at the time that he claimed to be. Because MacDonald's report described the cloud over Flagstaff, the prophet changed his story to claim that he had been at that location during the cloud event. While William Branham claimed to be present for a supernatural event, MacDonald was observing the cloud from a scientific perspective. This would have been extremely risky for Branham if not for the summary of MacDonald's preliminary investigation. At the time of the preliminary report, MacDonald had no idea what caused the cloud. That was all that Branham needed to distract his listeners from the question as to his actual whereabouts. Were they angels? Did they visit the prophet? His listeners were so intently focused upon whether or not the cloud was made by angels that none of his listeners questioned the timing of hunting season, the distance from his alleged hunting location, or even whether or not William Branham was in the state of Arizona at the time. The focus wasn't the location. It was the mystery. The focus was placed upon the cloud and the scientist, not on Branham's own location. They never noticed that Branham originally claimed to be near the southern border of Arizona, over 300 miles from the path of the cloud, or that he claimed that his hunting trip and cloud experience came after his trip to Houston. They never thought about the fact that if his Houston meeting was March 4th, while the cloud happened February 28th, he could not have went hunting after the Houston trip and stood beneath the cloud. It was too painful for me to see the information that made me completely reject something that I had believed since I was a small child. Details buried in the report, created by James MacDonald, 
simply didn't align with Branham's version of the story. We were never told that there was a second cloud, or that witnesses captured photos of the cloud's path across the state. Instead of angels piercing through the sky and heading to outer space, as Branham had claimed, we were never told that James McDonald continued his research after the preliminary report, and that he had multiple hypotheses explaining the cause of the formation. Like any scientist, McDonald created a list of items to investigate and then followed up on each item in the list. If he continued his research, and the message leaders in Arizona were so interested in using it to confirm the supernatural, then what was his conclusion? And why was it not discussed in the message? If the prophet really went from Arizona to Texas, to Arizona, then to Indiana because of a little boy saved from the electric chair, who was the little boy, and what did he do? There were more unanswered questions in the details than in the cloud story itself. By now, with everything that I'd uncovered about William Branham's private life, I could easily see why he would want to focus on a cloud rather than the timeline of his whereabouts. I myself was far more interested in the timeline. When the halo photograph of William Branham under the Houston Coliseum lights was captured, William Branham and the Voice of Healing did not have rights to use the photo. The photographers who captured the photo held the copyright. As late as December of 1950, they refused to allow Branham to use the photo in book sales. The photographers were Theodore Kipperman and James Ayers. When Branham was in Houston in the spring of 1963, he was protesting the execution of Ayers' nephew. January 14, 1963, Leslie Douglas Ashley and Caroline Lima were sentenced to death in Houston, Texas. Their executions were to be carried out on February 28th, the very day of the cloud event. For Texans in the early 1960s, this case would have seemed very unusual. Leslie Douglas Ashley was a quote-unquote female impersonator, and the events leading up to the murder were sexual in nature. His accomplice, Caroline, was a prostitute. Both dressed as female prostitutes, and the duo entered into a weekend of sex with real estate tycoon Fred Tomes. After murdering Mr. Tomes and burning his remains, they fled to New York where they were finally captured. William Branham bragged about helping stay the execution, but he never gave the details of how he did it. He claimed that he had talked the governor of Texas into a pardon, but that appears to have been an exaggeration. Execution was halted May 30, 1963, due to an insanity plea. Leslie Douglas Ashley began claiming that he was the biblical prophet Elijah, just as Branham himself claimed. I wondered, did William Branham save Leslie Douglas Ashley by teaching him how to act the part of his stage persona? After learning the nature of the crimes committed by the boy that William Branham claimed to have quote-unquote saved, I began to wonder why Branham got involved. I wondered what Mr. Iyer said to Branham to convince him to associate his name to the very negative publicity of this case. It would have been career suicide for any religious figure to try and defend Ashley. Was Branham convinced to assist the photographers because of the photo that Branham authenticated using George J. Lacey. Is this how he gained publishing rights? I found a court hearing for a case involving James Ayers and Theodore Kipperman, the two men who took the photo. Ayers had been convicted of counterfeiting, and Kipperman was involved, and they tried to appeal in January of 1952. He was investigated by the Federal Bureau of Investigation for forging the signature of Mrs. O. W. Tidwell. The jury found substantial evidence against the claims made by Ayers and Kipperman, and their appeal was denied. When Branham saved Ashley, whether by apparently convincing him to be the next Elijah or not, a religious entity was formed. James Ayers, the counterfeiter, and Leslie Douglas Ashley, the murderer, created a religious organization called the Ashley Ayers Evangelistic Association a new prophet Elijah was created. Leslie's mother, Sylvia Kipperman Ayers, was on the board of directors, and the strategy was effective. 
Ashley was deemed criminally insane and then was committed to an institution. That did not hold him, however, and he broke free. When he escaped, he was named in the FBI's top 10 most wanted list. Agents were told to be on the lookout for Ashley, who could be posing as either a man or a woman. They described him as extremely effeminate in speech and stated that he frequently dressed in women's clothing. According to the reports, they were looking for someone who associated closely with homosexuals and prostitutes while carrying a Bible and quoting from it. On April 24, 1965, Ashley was arrested by the FBI. He was working as a sideshow act in a carnival in Atlanta, Georgia. Federal agents sent Ashley back to Houston where he faced a new trial. After serving a 15-year sentence, Ashley changed his last name and his gender and became Leslie Elaine Perez. Under this name, Ashley ran for Harris County Democratic position as a transsexual candidate. Over time, Leslie Perez transitioned from an FBI's most wanted criminal into a respected political activist. By 1994, she was featured in a four-page spread in The Advocate. She regularly donated her time and money to helping liberal Democratic candidates run for election and was recognized for her infatigable support of Bill Clinton. She also spearheaded efforts to help the homeless, to fight crime, and to educate the public about the AIDS virus. With her mother Sylvia, she distributed condoms and safe sex literature to the streets of Houston. When William Branham described, quote unquote, saving a life for Leslie Douglas Ashley, this is not the outcome that I had pictured. The governor didn't pardon it, as Branham had claimed, and he didn't win an Oscar from the Humane Society, as Branham had claimed. Learning the details about the Prophet's Houston trip made me even more curious. By now, I was seeing a distinct pattern of claiming supernatural events while giving misleading or inaccurate details in his stories, and it appeared to be intentional. Details changed far too frequently. While it was clear the actual cloud event did not fit within the alleged timing of the events given in his sermons, I was still curious as to why message leaders in Arizona were not telling us what happened with McDonald's investigation. The West Coast had since 1959 been preparing a missile defense system in anticipation of Russian invasion. The intercontinental ballistic missile tests resulted in blasts or cloud phenomenon so frequently that the Air Force had to explain the results to the public. Details of the testing often made the Tucson newspaper, sometimes on the front page. This was especially the case after President Kennedy announced his inspection of the defense system. Vandenberg Air Force Base announced the nuclear testing of April 1962, and citizens of Arizona grew concerned that nuclear fallout from the detonations would threaten their environment. Almost every month, sometimes every week, details of Vandenberg's test program were published in the Tucson newspapers. Message leaders in Arizona would have been very familiar with these tests. As many as 750 missiles were being approved in other West Coast facilities, but the number being installed and tested in Vandenberg was classified to the public. The United States was entering the arms race, and most of the testing was carried out at Vandenberg. By July of 1963, the Titan II was nearly operational. To say that all the testing had Southern California and Arizona on edge would be a tremendous understatement. Jet fighter testing, mysterious explosions, and top secret testing of weapons of mass destruction kept the people of Arizona on their toes. Some of the blasts were close to home, making people wonder if the Russians had already invaded. When William Branham described hearing a blast to the people in Jeffersonville, Indiana, it would have had an altogether different meaning to the people in Tucson. Tucsonians were quite familiar with unexpected blasts. Also, when William Branham spoke of the scientist who investigated the cloud, any message believers in Tucson would have known that Branham was referring to University of Arizona's Dr. James E. McDonald. They would have also known that he was still investigating the cloud 
and that his initial query was not a final report. In fact, his confirmation that the cloud was not naturally formed would have been even more exciting to Branham's followers. Message believers in Tucson would have wondered if McDonald would eventually conclude that the formation was supernatural instead of unnatural. They would have also been curious to see how Washington responded. The Department of Defense was purposefully vague in their descriptions of the timeline for top secret testing. In some of the cases, they were denying events that could raise the curiosity of the Russians. Vandenberg Air Force Base did admit on March 30th that a routine launch had occurred. Almost daily, articles were being published describing McDonald's investigation. He and other colleagues worked together to triangulate the altitude and the path of the cloud and found that it was at an unbelievable altitude of 45 kilometers from the ground. Citizens in Arizona began sketching faces into the photos of the cloud. One woman sketched Jackie Kennedy's face. Others began to imagine shapes of fish or a hangman's noose. Message believers superimposed the cloud over paintings of Jesus Christ, and some of them believed that this was the image actually seen in the skies of Arizona. What they did not know at the time was that McDonald was not investigating the unnatural formation for normal scientific reasons. McDonald was trying to prove that the cloud was the result of otherworldly flying aircraft and that the United States had been visited by otherworldly beings. McDonald was not well respected among his peers, especially with regard to claims made during his investigations. While William Branham was claiming supernatural vindication by using James McDonald's initial query, his listeners in Arizona would have been reading reports of McDonald's scientific claim that aliens from outer space were invading the United States. McDonald was preparing research to present his theory on UFOs to the United States government. The February 28, 1963 cloud was but one of many examples that McDonald intended to use as proof that UFOs were alien technology. As a result, he was the target of ridicule in Arizona. But while message leaders in Tucson failed to mention McDonald's public speeches and discussions on UFOs to followers of the Branham movement, there is a more disturbing piece of information being concealed. The February 28th cloud research was abandoned after Vandenberg declassified the missile launch dates. When the Vandenberg Air Force Base published the launch history, both an Atlas D and a TAT Agenda D missile were confirmed to have launched on February 28, 1963. McDonald abandoned this particular set of clouds. They were then identified flying objects. McDonald's investigation of the cloud would pale in comparison to the investigation about to come. When President John F. Kennedy was assassinated, a large-scale inquiry into white supremacy groups was launched. Shortly after Lee Harvey Oswald stated that he was a patsy, Oswald was shot and killed by Jack Ruby. As a result, Roy Davis and everyone connected to him were part of the investigation. This investigation most certainly would have included the Reverend William Marion Marvin Branham.